Good morning. Greet you in the name of Jesus this morning, the one who is our author of salvation. We want to welcome everyone to our service this morning. We're glad you're here. As I was thinking, preparing, I'd like to make a comment on Laverne's thoughts there. You know, if you get the newspaper, they, they just publish the bad news many times. Um, and I asked someone one time, why, why do they just do that? And they, said, and they said, well, that's what brings in the money. That's what people want. As we think of that, we think of the author of those things, Satan, money, bad news. Give me concept. But I'm thankful for one thing. Our Goshen News has an article in the back page many times by a pastor, which is good news many times. It's not of the Mennonite faith, but he has some good news, and I'm glad it's there for the people to partake of. As we think of that which we're gathered together this morning of for our communion service of commemorating what the Lord has done for us and to meditate and to remember what Jesus did for us and what it cost. To get a basis of these things, my mind went back to uh, the very beginning, possibly, of God revealing himself. You know, in Genesis, right after man fell, God gave the thought that there's going to be a redeemer, that there's going to be a way of coming back. Man did that which God did. God wanted to, a, uh, communi- uh, wanted to be together, or wanted to have a, can't think of the word now, uh, a back and forth relationship with, relationships what I wanted a back-and-forth relationship with man, that which he created, and man destroyed that opportunity because Satan come in through his deceptive ways, just like he does today, and destroyed that opportunity. But God had a, went the second mile, and he made an opportunity for man to, and he promised that right there then. But another thought that came to me, and that was that uh, after the crucifixion, uh, Peter and uh, John were walking to Emmaus, and a stranger met them on the road, and it, which was really Jesus, and they didn't know it. He kept his eyes from it. And so as they were talking and being sad and so forth, Jesus began to instruct them, and it says they began at Moses to tell about himself and what he had done and what, was, what he was going to be and so forth. And the thing that was impressive of us, I read that again yesterday and the day before. Uh, he said, beginning at Moses, he began to say those things about himself. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus immediately disappeared. You know, beginning at Moses. So we see that even in the time of the Old Testament, there were those indications about the Messiah coming that would redeem mankind. So as my mind goes back to uh, for a, a thought, I, I'd like to also encourage you, have you, I, I had the blessed time of going through every gospel and reading the complete story and also 1 Corinthians 11. I appreciated it, just renewed. I'm getting more and more forgetful, but to just renew again each situation and how the Lord worked and the story concerning our salvation, how it became, came into being, that which God had planned before the foundation of the world, really. Scripture does tell us that. But beginning at Moses, I'd like to go back into Exodus and read a portion And this was at the time when the Israelites were being taken or were preparing to leave Egypt to go to the promised land. Uh, Moses was there, and God used him to try to be the leader and to draw out the people from Egypt 
from Pharaoh and the children of Israel, or the, uh, the people of Egypt. We notice that Egypt is a type of world and sin. And so God wanted to take his people out of that bondage into a liberty in Canaan. And so we see that there were 10 plagues that Moses presented before Pharaoh, and every time he refused to let them go. And it was devastating things that they went through. I can't imagine some of those things that they went through, but the last one was something that relates to the salvation through Jesus. And that was when the death angel was to come upon the land of Egypt. And let's, I'd like to turn to Exodus verse, uh, chapter 12, beginning to read in verse 3. And I'd like to read a, that portion just to remind us and get some thoughts in relation to those things that point out to the saving grace that God was pointing out. Remember, Jesus pointed out from the beginning of Moses, so he was including this part here and going on further to reveal to them how the, the Savior was to be. I'd like to read in verse, begin reading in verse 3 of chapter 12. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep and of the goats. And ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Very interesting point there as we see there. Keep that sheep or that lamb uh, for four days. And that was to verify that there was no sickness or anything wrong with that lamb. Bearing out the fact that it was a spotless lamb that would be taken. And also kill it in the evening or the afternoon. Thinking, you know, the afternoon is the evening in the Old Testament time. Bringing out the fact that in the afternoon, after 9 o'clock, uh, after or the ninth hour, which is 3 o'clock our time in today's age, would be the time where this lamb would be slaughtered. Verse 7, And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts of the upper door post of the, and the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, which... With bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat it not raw or sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head, his legs, and with the prudence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it shall in the morning, until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pa pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Amen, as far as I've chosen to read. We notice several things again in this portion of Scripture that are very interesting. 
I thought anyhow. First of all, we notice that uh, the flesh was to be burned with fire. It was not to be cooked or salt. Fire and burned give the indication of suffering. That of not desire, it's something that uh, happens quickly. It doesn't take as long to happen as cooking does. But it's to be indicating suffering and you might say torture. But that's what God had commanded Moses to do. And there's another aspect that's involved, and that's that it was to be done quickly uh, so that they would be ready. And they were to have shoes on their feet and so forth so that they, the spur of the moment, could move on. Likewise for us, God doesn't want to, pro, doesn't desire procrastination. He wants, when he speaks to your heart, if he speaks to me, he wants action. He wants me to take root of that which he's showing us and, and to move forward, allow it to be a blessing. And this here also is a part of it, you know. They were to have that doorpost, or you might say blood upon the doorpost and lentils covering that house, and they were to be in that house or they would not be protected. But the blood that was applied, that the lamb that was spotless, that was butchered for that sake, was to be spotless, and it was to meet the need there. It cost blood. Life is in the blood, and so God wants life for life. And that's, again, a thought of what would it take for uh, the salvation of mankind. The same time, I'd like to point out very vividly, you know, it takes our surrender and our will to be surrendered for God to be able to work in a salvation in our lives. And yet we could, and there are many in this world that have done those and are probably even doing it even now. That is, I could give my own blood. I could surrender it for the salvation of my soul, and it would not pass. It won't do it because I'm not a spotless lamb. My, I'm a born sinner, and it takes purity, and it, only Christ could do that. He was the spotless lamb. He didn't have any imperfections. And so, likewise, that is what God required. So my own life cannot buy my salvation. It has to be bought through Jesus. It has to be surrendered into Jesus. Also, we'd like to notice another aspect that we see here in this lamb. It was to be roasted with the head, the legs, everything. And if everything is there, there was no broken bones, is there? So we see on the cross, they didn't break Jesus' legs. It was prophesied that not one, broken, uh, one bone would be broken. Another prophecy fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross, even though the other two thieves had their legs broken so that they could die more quickly. Jesus had already died, and so they didn't do that. It's just another thing that was very interesting as I read through this here. You might say it's, you know, John the Baptist was a forerunner of Jesus' ministry and preaching. I see this here, Passover feast here, as a forerunner of what our service is this morning, of what Christ did for us. So much for that. I'd like to now turn to Matthew 26. I'm going to focus, our time keeps moving on, I'd like to focus this morning on the uh, cup of suffering or the sacrificial lamb that we find in Jesus that was we related to in Exodus 12. One thought I received from my study there was someone expressed some, a thought from Exodus 12 and said Jesus was perfect and in the fullness of his strength when he became the lamb of our Passover. Just a thought that I was impressed with. Jesus was perfect. He was spotless. 
and in the fullness of his strength, he was 30-some years old, in the prime of his life, and yet it, he died for our redemption. It was the perfect setting. Let's turn to Matthew 26, and I'd like to read two verses there in relation to what I'd like to talk about this morning is the two emblems of the Lord's Supper expressing redemption for lost mankind, representing redemption for the lost mankind. First of all, we want to, well, we'll read the scripture here in 26, verse 26 through 28. There it says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now it's interesting, another thought I came across as we see Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper in relation to the time that he was in of keeping the Passover. We notice that the Passover feast had, uh, was going to end with the life and the crucifixion of Christ. But the Lord's Supper was instituted, that of remembering that which Jesus did. All of those Old Testament sit sacraments that they did and so forth, all pointed to the Lamb of God, the slain, the sacrificial Lamb, and how he was crushed and glorified through it and brought redemption for mankind. But we notice one thing. In the Old Testament, the Lamb, we said what it took. You know, it had to be crucified or it had to be slaughtered, the blood removed, and it was to be roasted. But we don't see anything in the Lord's Supper about the meat, the, that, the food that they experienced in the Passover. That was because Jesus was the lamb, and it was crucified. And so now we have those emblems that represent the slain lamb. And the first one that we notice here that Jesus gave in his commanding the disciples about the supper that he was instituting is the unleavened bread. Unleavened bread typifies without sin, also demonstrated by the lamb without spot as an offering. Without sin. We know how leaven works in bread. First of all, it takes time. You have to set it out if you have bread that has leaven in it because it needs time to work, and, but it goes throughout the whole loaf. You put in a little bit and it goes throughout the whole loaf and it expands and becomes a loaf of bread. Unleavened bread is more of a wafer type that don't grow, don't. The time is involved. We notice that back in the time of the uh, Passover, they didn't have time, it needed to, it couldn't be leaven in the bread because there was no time involved. The time wasn't there to have that happen. And yet it gives a second point, that of being leaven is likewise a type of sin. And so we need to come out from that, not have, it has to be a purity. Then we also notice that Jesus broke it. It was broken and he dealt it out to the disciples he did the very same thing to those, to Peter and John, as they were together at the place of where he was going to reside for the night. He broke it and blessed it. We notice that there was a blessing in law. What does that blessing all mean? I'm not sure, but it has the grace of God applied to it, and it's that which typifies the broken body of Jesus. Jesus said, that's what it does. It tells us, take, eat, this is my body. And he had broken it. He took that and dealt it out to the disciples. 
Jesus broke the bread and gave it to each one, typifying his suffering. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 says, Jesus said, this is my body that is broken for you. That's what we'll probably be looking at even when we deal out the bread this morning. It's a type of suffering, the, the surrendering of Jesus, giving his life for our sakes. To take, eat, take hold of the salvation of Christ, receive atonement, approve of it, consent of it, submit to his grace. Deliverance from sin. Submission. I would say the last half year or so, I've been meditating on submission. And it's so vital to a Christian's life. And I've been admonished my own self of that of being submitted to the will of God and the things that he calls us to do. We notice that Jesus submitted to the plan of God, to the plan of redemption, even though it cost quite a bit. He knew what it cost. As we go back, and my mind goes to the Garden of Gethsemane there, where he was out, and he was pleading with God, and he looked into the that cup, we notice there's two different cups that we'll be thinking of today. Two different cups. And Jesus looked into the cup, and that was the cup that all the world of sinners was in there. And he looked at that, and it was going to, and he said, Lord, take away this cup if it be thy will. But he said, not my will, but thine see and understand the submission. And Jesus did not take away that cup, or God did not take away the cup that he needed to bear because it was the salvation of mankind. It was an agreement. I believe the, the manhood or the physical part of Jesus looked into the cup and seen all the suffering that it took, and it became weak in that area to the place where angels came and give him support to continue on. What a blessing, but it was for you and me. And as I thought of that, I also think of that as he looked into the cup, that I was in, my sins were involved in that cup. As I think of submitting, if God calls us to something and we don't want to submit, is it worth it? to stand against God and say, you made a mistake, that's, that's not me, I can't do that. There's always, to me, as I analyze that, I know many times when I entered the ministry, I know that was very real, and yet at the same time, I knew there's always a punishment, there's always a day of reckoning for one who stands against the will of God. But God has promised us to give us grace and strength to do what we seemingly think we can't do, but we don't want to uh, stand against God's call. We want to submit to it just as Jesus did, and there's going to be blessings involved. <clears throat> Look at the second article here, the cup of the fruit of the vine. He talked about it here. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The remission of sins for all mankind. That cup represents that lifeblood that flowed out from Jesus. The life that was there flowed out, and death came. And that was what it took. Just as the lamb that was slain in the Passover time, that blood was taken and put on the doorpost to show God that something had happened in that home. That is protected. God is able to protect when there's blood applied. Today, if we had the blood of Jesus applied to our hearts, he's going to Overlook. He's going to recognize that you're covered by the blood. 
And you are free from that enemy that wants to take away those blessings that God wants us to have in a relationship with him. At the same time, we also know that the cup was the fruit of the vine. I think Luke says, grapes must be crushed and processed before there is any juice or wine. So that again points out a picture of the suffering of Jesus. The Son of God suffered tremendously that we might be free. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. The one who cre helped create the world and its uh, inhabitants was cursed by God. I can't imagine how God felt to do that. And yet, that was an agreement that the Trinity had in redeeming lost mankind, Jesus became a curse. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That became fulfillment at Jesus' crucifixion. Goes on to say, drink ye all of it. Be a partaker of the free gift of salvation through Christ Jesus. Take part. Accept the gift that's there. Someday there will be a day of reckoning, and God is not going to be mocked. He looks into each one of our hearts and lives, and he sees whether the blood of Jesus is covering our life. If it has that door opening painted all around, do this in remembrance of me or my suffering, 1 Corinthians 11, 24, and 25. Don't be forgetful. We have a tendency. We're human, and we have a tendency to forget, but we need to continue to be reminded. Eternity is at stake. Luke 22, verse 53, in the last part, says, This is your hour and the power of darkness in relation to when Jesus was facing the crucifixion, talking about the devil and the darkness. It was his hour. Satan thought he was winning. He thought he was a captor. He'd done it, like Laverne said. He's the victor. But God is over all. God noticed his suffering and allowed an angel to come and encourage and strengthen him. The mercy of God. That mercy is still available today. But he didn't remove the cup. It needed to happen. Our incarnate God. Can you visualize the face of the Father? And I've done that many times. As a father myself, and I think of those things that happen in our time of growing up as a family. How sad it was. How it hurt when we had to administer some punishment to children. I remember the time, and I'll never forget it, when there was a administration of, of a wrong deed done. And when I come out, my wife said, yeah, well, one of the children was outside the door going like this. Yeah, that hurt even more. We had to settle that occasion, too. Can you picture how God felt when he had to leave Jesus so that redemption of mankind could be purchased and paid for, that we could be in communion with him again? The suffering agony precedes his death as we see through the scriptures, demonstrates his divine love toward us. I like to think of that divine suffering and agony in three different ways. First of all, in mental and emotional agony that Jesus went through. First of all, it was rejection. Rejection is an emotion very real to every person, something that has a tendency to wear us down fast. But, you know, 
We can look to someone who has not rejected us. Jesus suffered that rejection. In John 1, 11, it says, He came into his own, and his own received him not. There's many of you in here that face that rejection at one time or another, or maybe even going through it now. When family disowns you or doesn't accept you, turns their face against us, Jesus received that of his own people. At the Passover feast, one of them will deny me, betray me. We know who that was. That was Judas. Turned against him. Peter denied Jesus three times. But I'm thankful for one thing. There's a difference between Judas and Peter, and that was Judas did not repent. He was sorry, and he cast the money back. But he went and hanged himself. He sealed his own destiny because he found no hope. He didn't have a connection with Jesus. But Peter did, and he was sorry, and he wept, and he repented. And he went on to become one of the main ones to lead the church after the crucifixion of Jesus. Judas betrayed him with a kiss, 30 pieces of silver, money. What hypocrisy. How did Jesus feel at those times when those of his own people, the mental rejection, the agony, emotional. Jesus suffered terrible physical abuse, and we, we just read through that. So many different things. He was abused by the high priest, the Jewish spiritual leaders. They hated him. Even the worldly leaders noticed that hatred. Pilate said he knew that they brought him forth because of envy. Even Herod noticed that. It was because of envy. He couldn't find any fault. They spit on him. Oh, how derogatory that is. In the face. How un disrespectful. Yet, that's what they did. They hit him on the face with their hands. Said, had him blindfolded and they said, prophesy, you're a prophet. You told us many things you said. Who hit you? Anyhow, a mockery, tremendous mockery. He could have said who it was, but he didn't. They buffeted and mocked, mocked him. Hit him with the fist, is what one of the commentators said. Put on a royal robe and a crown of thorns. Mocked him as a king. And not only that, they took, a, took that scepter that he had, which was a stick, and hit him on the head with it. Take those thorns in deeper and the blood running down. <clears throat> At the hands of Pilate, then, after Pilate had told him, and his wife had told him not to be a, have any part with him because he's an innocent man. She suffered that because of a dream. So he let it in their hands. They said, well, we can't kill a man. It has to be you. So he then tried to, other techniques. I, Pilate was really stuck in a sense. He wanted to do all he could to get rid of him, so to uh, free him up. So one of the ways he did, he scourged him. He thought maybe he could bring up pity in the people when they see him to uh, uh, cause them to change their mind. And he was thronged with a whip that had jagged pieces of bone or mental to make the blow even more effective. They'd done it on his bare back. Psalms 129, verse 3, tells us a little bit. It was a prophecy, but it gives a picture of what was happening there at that time. There it says, it gives a word picture of his scourging. The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. How did that feel? 
hard for me to imagine. And yet there was Jesus, bleeding, his back wounded tremendously. Jesus was condemned to death on false witnesses. They pronounced judgment in, the, in an illegal trial. It was illegal for the Jewish law because it was done at night. And judgment, and it was also illegal by the Roman law. So there was illegal trial to bring this judgment to pass. Judgment was influenced by mob spirit overpowering Roman authority. Do we sometimes try to work that way? Remember who's in charge when we do. It's the devil. It's not that which is righteous judgment. He was crucified being, by being nailed to the cross. We all know that. But we try and picture how that all might be and how it hurt. Big nails hammered through his hands and feet. The suffering, my suffering Lord. Can you picture them gently placing the cross into the hole? They didn't have a crane there to put it in easily, nicely. It was probably picked up. They couldn't hardly do it by mankind. And then when he got in the hole, it fell down with Jesus hanging on nails. Oh, I can't imagine it. That's the worst kind of torture for mankind at that time under the Roman rule. But we see Jesus, and we hear Jesus saying, yet he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Divine compassion of our Lord. Jesus suffered separation from God for a moment. At the ninth hour, at three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I believe this was the physical part of man that was saying that. He had to suffer to the extent that he did. And then to be forsaken by God yet. So that the physical part could die. Because God is God of life. He cried, it is finished. The cup of wrath became a cup of blessing. Redemption and salvation for mankind. The slain lamb of God. Jesus cried with a loud voice and yielded up the ghost. He physically died. And his, like I said earlier, his bones weren't broken because he died early. But then there was a prophecy that was fulfilled. Why, why did the soldier poke his side yet? I think it was God that instituted that. To make sure that Jesus was dead, the soldier poked his side with a spear, and out came blood and water. That which, uh, the blood that cleanses, and the water is also an example of cleansing of a person's life. Washed by the blood of Jesus, cleansed for our redemption is in and through Jesus. And then he was glorified. He did not stay dead. He arose after three days, Luke 24, as it was prophesied. He was seen 13 times after his resurrection. He ate fish, honey, and bread. Said to Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. That's us today. We believe that that happened. And we believe that it's salvation for us. We trust in the shed blood of Jesus that it washes away the sin, our sin, and makes us in, takes us in connection with God. And not only that, we believe it, we have experienced it. 
the peace that is far greater than man can give, peace that lasts now and throughout eternity. <clears throat> Jesus then descended back to heaven, exalted, as Philippians 2.9 says, an exalted master. And he's up there interceding on our behalf, the scripture says. And what else is going to happen? He's going to return. <clears throat> Acts 11, 1, 11 says, This same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He is coming again, and he's going to take those who have been faithful and have applied the blood to their hearts and lives. He's going to take them back up to, to heaven with him. I'm looking forward to that time. And if we don't see that time, we die, or we come to the end of life before that, the same thing applies to us because it tells us after his resurrection, even those in the graves, some of those in Jerusalem arose from the grave and they were seen in the city. God is going to resurrect everyone. It doesn't matter whether your ashes are on the sea so that man think it can't be put back together. God has intimate ways. It will not happen. We will all resurrect, whether unto life eternal or unto eternal damnation. Closing thought I'd like to give is in Re found in Revelation 3.21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. This is the redemption of God that God wants for all mankind. The cup of wrath became the cup of blessing. Shall we look at it that way and apply that blood to our lives? Shall we kneel in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before Thee, thank You, thank You again for the suffering You went through. And as we look at that suffering, we think of the minute suffering we do today, and we sometimes let it interfere with our salvation experience. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to walk according to Your will and to accept those things, to submit unto it, Lord, and to praise you and allow it to be a blessing in our lives. That's what you want to do. But there, if we refuse, there's a curse going to be upon us. So, Lord, help us to accept your truth and to live according to your will and to be faithful and to bless thy name. And as we partake today of these blessings that are to be a reminder of your suffering, of what, you, what it cost you, and the Father and the Holy Spirit, as they made a provision that you supplied and paid the price that we could not pay ever. We would be lost throughout eternity if you wouldn't have been obedient. And we thank you for that. Your obedience caused you to be exalted and be at the right hand of God, interceding for us, and you're a judge of all, a righteous judge over all the earth when that day comes, the day of judgment. Be with us, and may your Holy Spirit anoint us with your truth as we go on from here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>